Hi, thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Helen Talley McRae, and I work in the One Health Office of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health Updates call on February 6, 2019. The content of these calls is directed to epidemiologists, laboratorians, scientists, physicians, nurses, veterinarians, animal health officials, and other public health professionals at the federal, state, and local levels. Please be aware that CDC has no control over who participates on this conference call. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality during these calls cannot be guaranteed. Today's call is being recorded, so if you have any objections, you may disconnect. Continuing education disclosure includes uh, information about uh, d detailed in instructions for obtaining free CE are available on our website and will be given at the end of this call. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses or partners disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Before we begin today's presentation, CDC's One Health Office Director, Dr. Casey barton Baravesh, will share some One Health News updates. Thanks for joining us for today's Zohu call and welcome to all of our new participants. We appreci appreciate you all for helping us spread the word about the Zohu call and letting your colleagues know that we now offer free continuing education as well as web on demand options. The Zohu call audience continues to grow and we now have over 11,500 subscribers representing professionals from government, non-governmental organizations, industry, and academia, as well as students. So welcome, everyone. Please continue sharing links to the Zohu Call website, which has information on how to subscribe to the Zohu Call email list and information on free continuing education for a variety of healthcare professionals. To begin today's call, I'd like to share the latest One Health news and resources with you. These links are all included in today's Zohu Call email reminder. Some of the new resources that are available include CDC's 2018 Antibiotic Resistance Investment Map. Also, the World Health Organization has posted 10 threats to global health in 2019. From March 6th to 8th, there is a conference from Consumers to Chefs, Food Safety Education Matters. That's taking place in Orlando, Florida. We've also shared some recent publication links, including publications on monkeypox transmission among international travel travelers, a tool to help commercial fishermen encountering sea-disposed chemical munitions, information on diagnosis around non-cutaneous Lyme disease, trends in opioid prescribing and dispensing by veterinarians in the state of Pennsylvania, community-wide recreational water-associated outbreaks of cryptosporidiosis and control strategies in Arizona, and Lyme disease emergence in Canada. There are also multiple outbreaks currently under investigation in the United States, including a new outbreak of salmonella infections linked to pet hedgehogs, and we'll actually hear more details on this one on the April Zohu call. There are four ongoing salmonella outbreak investigations, Details on the multi-state psittacosis outbreak among poultry plant workers in 2018 are available online. And a final update around the outbreak of listeria infections linked to port products has been posted. As always, a selected list of ongoing and past outbreaks in the United States of zoonotic diseases, as well as information on staying 
Safe and Healthy Around Animals Including Pets is available on CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. If you would like for us to share news from your organization, or if you want to suggest presentation topics or even volunteer to present, please contact us at zohucall at cdc.gov. And lastly, thank you again for your support of the Zohu Call and for joining us today. I'll turn it back over to Helen. Thank you, Dr. Barton Bar Baravesh. So the Zohu Call series objectives are describe two key points for each presentation, describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics, identify an implication for animal and human health, identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats, and identify two new resources from CDC partners. Today's presentation topics are zoonotic source attribution of Salmonella enterica serotype typhum, typhum urium using generic surveillance data and machine learning transmission of Francisella tularinus, the causative agent of tularemia by solid organ transplantation, and the role of wildlife in arbovirus transmission. You'll find resources and links for each presentation in today's Zohu Call email reminder and on our website. Questions for all of our presenters will be taken at the end of the call. <coughs> Please call, to ask questions, please call 1-800-593-8936 and enter passcode, participant passcode 9611836. Press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of each question. So just bear with me a moment. I have to switch presentations for our first presentation. Okay, our first presentation will be given by Dr. Shogang Zhang. Please begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you, Helen. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I will introduce you the application of whole genome sequencing and machine learning to source attribution of the Manala Tasmirum. And my name is Shogang Zhang. And right now, I'm a bioinformatics scientist in Clear Lab a company focused on next generation sequencing and pathogen detection. But uh, all of the work presented here were done in University of Georgia during my PhD and uh, postdoc. Uh, firstly, why do we need to know the source information for pathogen isolate? Because it can help us to estimate food safety burdens and uh, track pathogen origins. But the reality is that around 95% of the foodborne illness have no information about uh, food uh, ex uh, exposure and uh, contamination source. Uh, whole genome sequencing is transforming today's clinical microbiology, and uh, it is being widely used in surveillance and research. So we'd like to try if WGS can offer an alternative for source prediction. Um, we downloaded about uh, 2,000 uh, tafamirum genomes from Genome Tracker and uh, other public available databases. And the majority of them are from the United States. And uh, we firstly built the phylogenetic tree using about uh, 40,000 co-genome SNPs, uh, which is the figure on the left side. And the biosyn based uh, population analysis divided it into 10 groups for the 2,000 genomes from G1 to G10. We can observe there are very clean source associations or clustering for the population structure. For example, G2 to poultry, G4 to white bird, G6 to bovine, and G10 to both bovine and the swine. And a significant clustering and association was also detected using permutation-based statistics. And this shows the potential of whole genome sequencing in source prediction. However, does the previous 
source association I just showed to you equal to that, the genome lineages are already host adapted? The answer is no. It might be a random corresponding. So we need to dig a deeper behind the association and suppose that some of the lineages are host adapted because without proving it, it might be just a random observation. And if you change it to another data set uh, with the new genomes, the, this association might be different. And due to the limits of time, I will not show the uh, biological and the evolutionary evidence one by one, but uh, the details can be found in my most recent paper. And generally speaking, uh, we show that there are biological and evolution stories behind this observation, and uh, well, it is not just a random correspondence. Okay, so far, um, uh, after we have supported that uh, host uh, adaption is very likely existent in some nullity of mirror, and uh, it leads the foundation of source attribution using Holden sequencing. And then the next, qu next question is how to do it. Um, the answer is random forest, which is my favorite machine learning method with reliable and accurate performance. Uh, again, due to the limit of time, uh, here I will not cover details on how does the random for forest pre prediction works. Uh, but I do have some slides in my appendix if you are interested in it during question time. Um, so the general picture is that uh, we need to convert uh, this matrix. Uh, okay, the, well, the rows, the rows are features which can be, um, um, the columns are features which can be the presence and absence of different SNPs, uh, indels, or accessory genes in one genome. And the rows, uh, the name of the rows can be the genomes from S1 to S1473. They, uh, they are sample 1 to sample 1473. Uh, this is a genome set uh, trimming all the redundancy, uh, so the genome number was reduced. And the random forest uh, can be used to conform the feature matrix to the final result matrix. So each value in the result matrix here represents the possibility of the genome linked to the source. For example, for sample one, S1, 10% uh, of the possibility is from, uh, from poultry and 90% uh, of possibility from whiteboard. For S2, uh, it's 95% uh, possibility from porcine and 5% uh, from whiteboard. Uh, so random forest uh, can help you to, to do things like that. So in general, by random forest method, uh, we got 83% uh, accuracy overall. Uh, here are the ROC curves of the major for zoonotic sources. The sources are in different colors, and uh, we can see that the classifier performed the best in predicting poultry and swine, followed by bovine and white bird. The reason behind that are due to uh, sampling intensities. Swine and the poultry have the highest uh, sampling intensities followed by bovine and white bird in our sampling data set. Um, this from another view shows that uh, whether includes suitable samples in training data sets is very, very important for machine learning based methods. Uh, in addition, we apply our approach with real world samples. Uh, um, it made correct attribution for seven out of eight major zoonotic outbreaks linked to Seminolata Femirum reported by CDC in recent 15 years, uh, which was shown in this table. As you can see, most of them were correctly predicted by our model. Oh, these two figures seem to be overlapped by each other. Um, okay, so random forests uh, can also give you which features played top ranked roles in the classifier. So by extracting and evaluating the top ranked features individually, uh, we further identified a small set of key genomic uh, uh, features. For example, the top 50 was sufficient for the robust uh, livestock source, uh, uh, source prediction. 
uh, this is very good because uh, next time when you uh, have the uh, when you have a new genome, you don't need to look at the whole genome, but just look at the uh, top 50 genomic figures. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, the first figure was over overlapped uh, by my second one. Um, the second figure shows you uh, what are they for the top 50 features. And generally, most of them are accessor genes. And by checking the publications, quite a few of them have been reported to be related with the source adaption. So overall, we conducted a, a comprehensive population genetics research on tafemirum in surveillance system. And uh, with support of host adaption, a machine learning rainforest classifier was applied for major livestock with high accuracy. In addition, a small set of features is enough for a rapid push-button solution for the source attribution using whole genome sequencing data. However, limitations still existed. For example, firstly, the majority of our analysis are United States isolates, while not international isolates. Um, but on the other hand, this bias might be not bad. Uh, it may reflect the epidemiology of tafemirum in the US and uh, better serve the purpose of attributing United States isolates. And secondly, we have to admit that some of the genomes in mixed lineages are very challengeable to be predicted by our model, and more work needs to be done. Um, for acknowledgement, uh, many thanks to my colleagues uh, and the supervisors in UGA, CDC, FDA, MDH, and TGEN. And this is a project supported and conducted by our mutual effort. And I also list my professor's email here for for the questions and contact about this project. And you're also welcome to contact me for technical questions using my personal emails. Uh, okay, this is my presentation. Thanks, many thanks for your attention. Great, right, thank you so much for that presentation. Let me uh, switch back to the other one. Bear with me. Okay, our next presentation, transmission of Francisella tularensis, the causative agent of tularemia by solid organ transplantation, will be given by Dr. Christina Nelson. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Helen, and thank you all for listening in, and thanks also to the Zohu Call organizers for having me. Uh, can everyone see my slides? I'm actually not seeing them. Christina, I can advance them if you if you'd like. I'm sorry you can't see them. Um, yeah, um, Laura is looking on uh, the presenter mode and can see them. Okay. If you'd like, Wait, there are some there are some animations, so we'll have to advance those as well. Okay, you just um, let me know and I'll go ahead. Okay, thanks. So today I will talk about the first known transmission of Francisella tularensis by organ transplant. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit of background about tularemia. It's caused by the bacteria Francisella tularensis, which is a tier one bioterrorism agent. Uh, there are about 125 cases reported per year in the United States. Tularemia also occurs in other parts of the world in the northern hemisphere. And in the United States, it's reported from all states except for Hawaii. It's transmitted through arthropod bites. You can see it that on the top pictures there, um, primarily ticks and deer flies. Uh, also direct contact with infected animal tissue. You can see a picture of a rabbit there. Um, often it's contracted by um, hunting and contact with infected tissue such as rabbits. Uh, tularemia is also known as rabbit fever. Also an in inhalation of contaminated aerosols. You can see the picture of someone lawn mowing there. Uh, for example, running over a carcass can aerosolize infected particles and infect uh, people via the lungs. And also ingestion of contaminated food or water. 
The clinical form depends on the route of infection. The most common form is ulceroglandular, um, where there's an ulcer at the site of inoculation where the bacteria entered the skin, and then swollen lymph nodes uh, proximal to that. But there are other forms, pneumonic or tularemia pneumonia, oropharyngeal, ocular glandular, um, where someone um, touches their eye and gets infected that way, and there are uh, other forms as well, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. So we were first uh, notified of this outbreak uh, by a call that came in. A, a hospital in laboratory reported to State Health Department that they presumptively identified a Francisella species from a human blood sample. The patient was a female kidney transplant recipient who developed septic shock after the transplant. Uh, and then, Helen, if you could uh, click again. I have an animation that should come up. Uh, meanwhile, on the same day, the local public health laboratory in another state reported to the LRN, which stands for the Laboratory Response Network, presumptive identification of a Francisella species from a human blood sample. The patient was a male kidney transplant recipient who developed septic shock post-transplant and actually died. He had already died by the time Francisella tularensis was identified. So this was very unusual and required further investigation. Next slide, please. So further investigation revealed that these two patients had a common donor. So a public health investigation was initiated to uh, first identify the source of Francisella infection for these two recipients. The, a donor-derived infection is obviously the most likely explanation, but it's not the only explanation. There could have been infected blood transfusions, contaminated surgical equipment, perhaps an error in Francisella identification. So we really needed to figure out um, how these infections occurred. Locate additional organ recipients and treat them appropriately. Characterize the donor illness further. Did he have obvious tularemia that was perhaps missed, or did he have a more subtle or nonspecific form of tularemia? And if the donor was, in fact, a source of infection, identify potential environmental exposure sources for the donor. Basically, how did he get it? And if there is any ongoing risk, we, uh, we needed to mitigate that to other community members. Next slide, please. So investigation revealed that a third organ recipient uh, from the same donor did exist. So three organs were transplanted. It was a heart transplant in this case, and the patient actually was doing well, fortunately. And no other tissues or organs were transplanted. Next slide, please. So more information about the donor. He was a middle-aged man who resided on tribal lands in the southwest. He had a history of alcohol abuse and had actually abruptly ceased alcohol intake five days prior to admission. He presented with fever, respiratory distress, and vomiting blood. He was admitted to the hospital for presumed aspiration pneumonia, which is common with alcoholism, so it seems like a likely diagnosis, sepsis and al alcohol withdrawal, and treated uh, with just kind of broad-spectrum antibiotics. You can see on the image here a chest uh, CT. Uh, he's laying on his back, and this is a cross-section image looking from the feet up. Uh, the red arrow shows a three-centimeter round focus of pneumonia in the right lower lobe of the lung. And the blue arrow, you can see pleural effusion, so that's fluid collecting kind of at the bottom there that's around the lungs. He had progressively worsening thrombocytopenia. His platelets were very low. And on hospital day 11, he had copious blood loss via vomit and stool. He basically bled out. Uh, and he had multiple multi-organ failure and two cardiac arrests and was subsequently declared brain dead. Next slide, please. So this slide is animated. You should be able to see kidney recipient one here. He was a man in his 40s. Uh, he developed fever and hypoxia four days after transplant, became very sick. They put him on broad-spectrum antibiotics, but um, vancomycin and meropenem don't really cover Francisella. And he developed coagulation problems, septic shock, and died the next day after getting, set, um, getting sick, tragically. Uh, click again, if you will, Helen, please, for the next kidney recipient. It was a female in her 60s. Uh, she, had, she developed fever also four days post-transplant. She was treated with vancomycin ceftriaxone. She also developed low platelets and respiratory failure. Um, fortunately, the healthcare team learned of the first kidney recipient's death and broadened her coverage. They still didn't know that it was from Francisella, but they added doxycycline, um, which fortunately does cover for Francisella, and she recovered. And then if you can click again, please, the heart recipient. 
uh, was a man in his 40s, and he actually just happened to be on ciprofloxacin and ceftriaxone um, up until the day of transplant because he had a medical device that was colonized with bacteria. Um, both of these antibiotics, especially ciprofloxacin, have activity against Francisella. Um, so he developed fever just several hours after transplant and septic shock shortly after that. Um, that was actually, that's actually pretty soon, and they think it actually may have been due to manipulation of this infected device during the surgery. He had uh, broad spectrum antibiotic um, treatment, and he recovered. Next slide, please. So we worked closely with the local health department, and um, they were able to interview the donor's family by phone. He lived in a rural area. He had no pets. There was no no contact with sick animals or other noteworthy exposure. There were animals around the property, but no obvious die-offs. And the donor was unemployed, and he hadn't traveled recently. So this really uh, left us scratching our heads. There was no smoking gun. Um, further investigation revealed that the donor had received many blood transfusions during his time in the hospital. Um, and the American Red Cross came in and really did a nice job doing a blood donor traceback and thoroughly investigated all of those blood donors. None of them, um, all of them except one actually um, seemed healthy after donating blood. One of them actually had some symptoms but was tested and was negative. So was, there was no indication that the tularemia was from a blood transfusion. Next slide, please. As part of the investigation, bank samples from the donor were recovered. Um, and so you can see here that most of the tissues and fluids that were tested were actually negative from the donor. Uh, Helen, if you please uh, click, you can bring up that circle that shows the spleen was actually culture positive for Francisella tularensis, which uh, makes sense actually Francisella is tropic to the spleen. And serology testing revealed that he was seropositive with a titer of 1 to 128. And this culture and serology was performed at CDC Fort Collins Diagnostics and Reference Team. Next slide, please. So laboratory testing for the recipients revealed that kidney recipient one, um, that again, this is the one who died, all of the organs, all of the organs that were tested uh, were positive, and also for kidney recipient two, she's the one who recovered, but she had um, Francisella in all of the samples that were tested. And if you can click again, Helen, this will reveal the heart recipient. His culture and serology testing was actually negative. So both re kidney recipients were obviously infected in multiple locations throughout the body. Um, the heart recipient, no solid evidence of Francisella infection, but remember, he had been pre-treated before the surgery with, with Cipro, which uh, does cover against Francisella. Next slide, please. We should be on the strain typing slide, hopefully. Yes. Yeah. OK, great. So characterization uh, of this bacteria was performed by CDC Diagnostic and Reference Team in Fort Collins. Uh, PCR genotyping of the isolate from the donor spleen found that it was subspecies tularensis type clade A2. Um, there are two types in the US, type A and type B are the major types, and um, those have different geography and mortality rates. You can see from the kidney recipients 1 and 2, it was the same subspecies tularensis clade A2. If you click again, please. Uh, it will show that the reference and diagnostic team also performed PFGE typing, whole genome sequencing, and whole gen genome multilocus sequence typing. This found that strains from the donor and the two recipients were indistinguishable. So basically, this was a slam dunk. There was undeniable evidence that the donor was infected and transmitted this infection to at, at least to the kidney recipients. We really still don't know about the heart recipients. Next slide, please. So an environmental investigation was conducted by the local health department and also the Indian Health Service. They went to the neighborhood to really see boots on the ground if there's any way we can find out how the donor was infected. Um, so if you keep clicking, Helen, you will show um, there were two logomorph carcasses um, that were found. They were either rabbits or hares. It was highly decomposed, so it was hard to tell. Um, PCR testing and genotyping of DNA from bone marrow um, done at CDC in Fort Collins found that they were positive for, again, F. tularensis subspecies tularensis clade A2, same as what was found in the donor. So if you click, keep clicking through to the next slide. Uh, because there was evidence of Francisella in the environment, the local health department, IHS, and CDC uh, put together an educational campaign for healthcare providers and community members. Uh, this included handouts for healthcare providers really to identify new cases or recent unrecognized cases 
um, and also inform the public about potential ongoing risk. And there was a community meeting as well to answer questions and inform people about it. Next slide, please. So in summary, this is the first known transmission of Francisella tularensis through solid organ transplantation. This is also the first known human-to-human -human transmission of, of tularemia in recent history. There are some very old cases that have been described, but it does not occur commonly. All three organ recipient recipients had septic shock, and one died tragically. Strain typing provided strong evidence for donor-transmitted infection. An environmental investigation helped recognize recent, a recent epizootic and die off near the donor's residence. And this really helped educational efforts to protect the community members. But some questions remain. To what extent did tularemia contribute to the death of the donor? We still don't know if he died of tularemia or if he died with tularemia. He definitely had other medical issues going on at the same time, so it's hard to tell. Um, and we still don't know about the heart recipient. Recipient, We don't know if his fever and septic shock were related to tularemia or the infected device or something else. Next slide, please. So recommendations, does this event warrant a change to the donor screening processes? Um, probably not, but we would encourage uh, clinicians to consider targeted screening based on risk factors if people come up with those. And really, the risk to recipients of infection from any pathogen must be balanced with the great need for organs. Um, a lot of people ask me or others involved in this investigation, why were these organs transmitted? This guy obviously was very sick and died of pneumonia. But um, 20 people die every day while waiting for a transplant. And people die of pneumonia also all, often. And, and um, organ transplants are successfully performed after that. So um, we don't want to apply a retrospective scope and um, say that something was obviously missed or a transplant should not have been performed. So awareness and recognition are very important. We now know that Francis Stella tularensis can be trans Admitted via organ transplant, and it is treatable with antibiotics, so it's important to recognize. Um, in general, identification of tularemia can be challenging, so clinical suspicion is paramount. Uh, tularemia can have nonspecific signs. Standard culture techniques of five days might not identify it in the laboratory. Um, so you really have to suspect it and request the appropriate laboratory testing to diagnose this infection. So this is true both for potential organ donors and also any patient with risk factors for tularemia. We would encourage clinicians to be aware of that and um, suspect it and order testing when indicated. This is my next and last slide, acknowledgments. There were so many people involved in this investigation who really worked hard and helped make this happen. And I really want to thank all of the people on this um, slide. There were many moving parts of this investigation. Also, there were many others in addition to people listed on the slide from the tularemia and transplant recipients investigation team who I would like to thank um, for helping with this investigation. Uh, this actually, this report was just accepted by EID, Emerging Infectious Diseases, and should be published online soon and will appear officially in the April issue of EID. So thank you all again for listening. I really appreciate it. And I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the call. Great. Thank you so much, Christina. And um, we were just checking just so you'll be able to see the screen later when the Q&A uh, looks like you're not logged into Adobe Connects anymore. So if you could uh, go ahead and do that, then at least you'll be able to see the screen later. OK. I must have gotten kicked off somehow. Thank yeah, you. Sorry about that. I think we, we did pretty well, though. With the <laughs> yeah, we, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. OK, our final presentation, The Role of Wildlife and Arbovirus Transmission, is by Dr. Eric Hoffmeister. Please begin when you're ready. Hi, Helen. Uh, I'm also having problems with, with my screen. Uh, since the furlough, a number of us come, have come back and have, have had problems with our password. So I'm flying blind as well. All right. Well, I see you're still, somehow you're connected as a presenter, but I'm happy to go ahead and um, advance your slides. So just All right. Let me All right. Know so when. the title slide is showing? Yes. Um, I work at the National Wildlife Health Center. I'm a veterinarian. But I'd say for the last 15 years, I'd probably describe myself more as a experimental biologist. OK, um, next. In the next 10 to 12 minutes, I'm going to briefly introduce the field of arboviruses in general, and then focus on wildlife as reservoirs in mosquito and tick-transmitted viruses. Arboviruses are arthropod-borne, hence the arbo, viruses of plants and animals. Most arboviruses are RNA viruses, representing multiple families, 
although there are a small number of DNA arboviruses of both plants and animals. Next, arboviruses are transmitted by insects through mos including mosquitoes, flies, and midges, and by arachnids, including both soft and hard-bodied ticks. Mosquito feeding is the most important route of transmission for human arbovirus disease, while tick feeding is the most important for veterinary medicine. Transmission can be mechanical, sometimes termed flying needle, on the mouth parts of a vector. These are most important for the plant arboviruses, or biological in the case in which the virus is internalized by the vector with the blood meal and it replicates within the vector. Biological transmission is the most important for both human and veterinary medicine. Among the hematophagous vectors, feeding style varies from mosquito feeding. On the left is a drawing showing a mosquito feeding using her proboscis to obtain a blood meal directly from a capillary in the dermis of the skin. On the right, tick feeding is illustrated, showing the tick feeding from pooled blood and fluid in a cavity just below the dermis. In tick feeding, virus is delivered into the feeding site along with saliva, regurgitated gut content, and in the cement that the tick excretes to bind itself to the feeding site. Besides the location the virus is deposited, the feeding is brief in the case of mosquitoes and prolonged in the case of ticks. An interesting feature is that uninfected ticks feeding close to an infected tick on a host may become infected through non-viremic transmission. Virus is transmitted through the connective tissue and not through the circulating blood. Non-viremic transmission may, may be a significant way in, some tick, in which some tick-borne arboviruses are maintained. Next, please. I'll be using three arboviruses in the alphavirus genus of the Togaviridae family that cause human disease. For the sake of time, I'll skip on to the next slide. So next, please. In eastern equine encephalitis, wildlife serve as both the reservoir and the amplification host in an enzootic cycle between passerine birds and Culicida melanura as the vector. This brings up the concept of reservoir and amplification host. Reservoir hosts maintain the virus in nature, but in the case in this model of transmission, certain birds that develop high viremias that transmit the virus to a significant proportion of feeding mosquitoes and are also very numerous in the environment serve as amplification hosts. This increases transmission both within the enzootic focus and allows the virus to spill over to other hosts, horses, humans, pigs, and some non pasturing birds. Culicida melanura primarily feeds on birds, so other vectors, termed bridge vectors, transmit the virus to hosts such as horses and humans. Horses and humans do not develop sufficient viremia to infect mosquitoes and are termed dead-end hosts. Other mosquitoes, including some Culex species, feed on reptiles and amphibians. Recent work suggests that reptiles, especially snakes, may play a role in the maintenance of the virus, perhaps as an overwintering host. Next, please. In the case of Venezuelan equine encephalitis, an enzootic transmission cycle exists between rodents, in this case, and mosquitoes. Like EEE, humans can be infected by the feeding of infected mosquitoes from the enzootic focus, but certain strains of VEE can infect horses that serve as amplification hosts that drive the epizootic outbreaks. Both horses and humans, in the case of VEE, develop sufficient viremia to infect mosquitoes, but generally in the absence of horses, an epizootic hasn't been maintained. Next, please. In the case of chikungunya, the virus is maintained in a selvatic cycle between non-human primates and mosquitoes, in which humans can be infected through the feeding of an infected mosquito. But a mutation occurred around uh, the mid-2005 uh, uh, or so, allowing for Aedes albopictus to be a very efficient vector. Humans developed sufficient viremia to infect feeding vectors. The cervatic cycle still exists, but the urban cycle is maintained between, between humans and mosquitoes. Next, please. In searching for the wildlife reservoir in mosquito-transmitted arboviruses, the following are considerations. Vectors to humans may not be the same as those in the selvatic cycle. Think of the bridge vectors. 
known host feeding preferences and molecular methods such as the amplification of DNA from mosquito blood meals aids following the virus trail. This is what led researchers to recognize that both amphibians and reptiles could serve as potential reservoir hosts for EEE. With the exception of overwintering via eggs or diapaused resting females, time frames are short, uh, for example, seasonal. Next, please. Switching to tick-transmitted arboviruses currently in North America, there are three recognized human tick-borne arboviruses sometimes termed TBO viruses, Powassan, Heartland, and Bourbon viruses. For the sake of time, I'll discuss only Powassan and Heartland viruses, and I'll skip the rest of this slide. Next. In searching for the wildlife reservoir in tick-transmitted arboviruses, vectors to humans are likely the same as those in the sovatic cycle. Bridge vectors are not recognized as being that involved, but each stage of the tick vector can feed on different host species. Time frames are longer, as short as months, and as long as several years. Multiple opportunities exist to acquire virus through the six stages of development. Experimental confirmation of important, the importance of wildlife as a reservoir is a bit more difficult. Next, please. This shows the two-year uh, life cycle of the deer tick, Ixodes scapularis. This pertains to the Northeast and the Upper Midwest. However, ever for the sake of time, I won't go into this life cycle in detail except to point out, larvae hatching from eggs in the spring of year one, that would be the top horizontal line, are not questing as adults until the fall of the year two, the bottom horizontal line. So there is the two year extended period of transmission of virus. All three tick stages, larvae, nymphs, and adult females, feed on vertebrate hosts that may, in the case of wildlife, be reservoir hosts for the arbovirus. Virus is maintained through the tick stage transition, larvae, nymphal to, to adults. Next, please. This slide shows the geographic location by state of residency of human uh, Powassan virus cases occurring from 2008 to 2017 showing human cases occurring primarily along the, the northern mid-Atlantic and New England coast and the upper Midwestern states. Two lineages of the virus are described. Lineage one is vectored by Ixodes cookii, which feeds primarily on groundhogs in their burrows, but it's also been found on skunks, raccoons, red foxes, and porcupines, and also by Ixodes marxi, known as the, the squirrel tick, but that also feeds also on other small rodents, raccoons, foxes, rabbits, and skunks. Both positive serological results and Powassan virus isolations have been described from both groundhogs and skunks. Lineage two Powassan virus, also called the deer tick virus, deer ticks collected at sites with seropositive paramiscus mice have been positive for the virus using molecular detection. But the virus hasn't been detected, has been isolated from paramiscus mice. A closely related tick-borne encephalitis virus in Europe and Asia has been isolated from myotes, those would be voles, and apodemus, mouse species. However, deer tick virus has not been detected in a small number of voles captured in coastal New England. Next, please. Another tick transmitted human disease in the United States is Heartland virus which was first isolated from a human case in 2009. Cases were first reported in Missouri and Tennessee. The virus is a member of the flebovirus genus of the Bunyaviridae family. It causes fever, fatigue, headache, muscle aches, and nausea in humans. A study of ticks and mosquitoes in northwestern Missouri detected Heartland virus only in Amblyoma americanum, the Lone Star tick, and thus implicated this tick as a vector. This tick feeds on small rodents, medium-sized mammals, wild turkeys, and especially all three stages of the virus on white-tailed deer. Next, please. This slide shows the results of a study published in 2015 showing positive neutralizing antibody for Heartland virus in raccoons and a smaller number of white-tailed deer, opossum, and rabbits. Red states it red indicates states with seropositive animals, and it extends from Maine south to Florida and from Illinois to Texas in the west, 
although wildlife weren't tested in all states. Gray indicates states with testing but no seropositive animals. This is roughly the range of Amblyomma americanum in the United States. The small map on the right shows in blue states which with, in which heartland virus has been isolated from human cases up to 2018, it, uh, a little bit larger than 40 people. This includes a large block of states centered in Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, West Virginia, and Tennessee, but now includes uh, North Carolina and Georgia additionally. The detection of antibodies in wild animals, wild mammals tested does not prove that they are reservoirs or amplifying hosts of the virus. Experimental exposure to determine the amplitude and duration of the resulting viremias and the ability to infect tick vectors would be required to establish their roles as hosts. Uh, next, please. These guidelines for the implication of a mosquito species as a vector for arbovirus were published after West Nile virus was transported to the United States, North America in 1999. First, repeated detection of the virus in field collected mosquito, mosquito species. Second, laboratory proof of vector competence, meaning the ability of a species to acquire and transmit the virus. And last, the association of virus positive mosquitoes and infected vertebrate hosts in the field. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is my last. I've seen several guidelines to implicate wildlife species as an arbovirus uh, reservoir. Suggestive are significant host for the putative or known vector, positive serology, which would indicate exposure, molecular detection of the virus, although I might actually move this to the next category. In the confirmatory category, repeated detection of the virus in field captured animals by either uh, isolation or uh, molecular means. Laboratory proof of host competence, again, that would be the ability to acquire and transmit the virus back to a vector. And last, association of virus positive hosts and infected vectors. Although this may be difficult to do considering the delays between tick stages, yet at certain times of the year, all the, the stages of certain ticks are active at the same time. So you could get a, a window on uh, infection in different developmental stages at the same time, roughly. And the last slide, thank you. How did we do, Helen? Great. We um, got all of those on time, I think. So all right, we are ready for a Q&A session. So questions, um, if you'd like to ask a question, please call, if you haven't already, 1-800-593. 8936 and enter participant passcode 9611836. Press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the operator, sorry, name the presenter or topic at the beginning of each question. Sarah, do we have any questions queued up yet? One moment. Our first question is from Jen Brown with the Indiana State Department of Health. Hi there. My question is about the tularemia investigation. I was wondering if PFGE or whole genome sequencing was performed on the isolates from the rabbit carcasses that were collected during the environmental investigation of the donor's residence. Hi, Jen. Uh, this is Christina. Thanks for that question. That's a good question. Um, it was not performed, um, but they, they were only able to get from the um, bone marrow since it was so highly decomposed um, and also felt that since it was such a specific clade that was found um, that it was sufficient to link it. Great, thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 from your phone, unmute your line, and speak your name and affiliation clearly when prompted by the system. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star 2. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Please stand by for further questions.
we have no questions in queue. Thank you. I'll just wait a few more moments. Hopefully, get another question. One moment. We do have parties queuing up. We have a question from Brian Schultz, an independent academic researcher. Brian, your line is open. Hello. I study uh, these biological models uh, for use in uh, applications for machine learning and uh, cyber uh, defense. The question, I don't mean to put any of the presenters on the spot, but in, in tracking these outbreaks, it's often uh, related to how early someone uh, notices a pattern. And uh, with the Adobe logins, for the CDC uh, logins not working after the furlough, this would be uh, an example of where the uh, cyber model uh, transfers over to um, you know, a case where it has it been reported to your IT team or to the uh, U.S. Uh, CERT, you know, the, the cyber uh, emergency response team yet? Um, so I think the, the question that you ended up asking um, is actually was not CDC's um, computers that we had any issues as we were not expected by any of that. But um, did you have a question for one of our presenters? Because you, you mentioned machine learning. so. No, I was just making the observation that if um, after a furlough, two people had CDC logins. Yeah, and it, it did not affect CDC logins. So if you don't have any any other question um, related to the presentations, and we'll we'll go ahead and take another question. Yeah, I don't mean to detract from the presentation. I was just concerned about pattern of logins not working after people. We're not at work. Right. Now I appreciate that. Um, we're just going to go ahead and move on for another uh, question yeah. about a presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Emily Holman with the Long Beach Health Department. Hi. Um, my question was uh, regarding the tularemia as well. I was just curious. Um, it sounds like after um, the first uh, recipient was diagnosed, it sounds like you found out about the second case in another, I believe it was another state, or at least another jurisdiction, um, pretty quickly. And I was wondering how you found out, because I know sometimes communication among jurisdictions or states is, is sort of difficult, and I was kind of wondering that, how that happened. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we found out through notifications um, that are facilitated by the Laboratory Response Network. Uh, so since Francisella is the Tier 1 agent, um, when it is presumptively identified, um, there's a network of notifications that includes CDC um, folks who um, work on those pathogens. And so fortunately, that system worked, and we got the notification um, through that system and also from the health departments for the first one, and then, uh, as I mentioned, shortly after the second one. Okay, thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one from your phone, speaking your name and affiliation clearly when prompted by the automated system. Our next question comes from Chris Paddock. Chris, if you could please state your affiliation and which presenter you're directing your question. Your line is Hi, open. I'm, Hi, I'm with the uh, Rickettsial Zoonoses Branch at Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, my question is for Christina. Thank you very much. It, it was a great, great talk. Um, you, I, I think you mentioned this, and I might have missed it, but did you say that tularemia has been transmitted via blood transfusion? There's uh, no, we haven't heard of that before. Um, it was 
and it would be unlikely since the bacterial load, even in patients who are ill, is usually low. Um, and, you know, people, if they are feeling ill, would be denied from uh, donating blood. Um, but the American Red Cross and everyone on the investigation team, basically for due diligence, really wanted to um, investigate that and um, make sure that it was evaluated and removed as a possibility. So that's why they were pulled in and um, contacted all of the donors. But it has not re been reported. Okay, thanks. And then um, in the environmental assessment, um, you mentioned you found two uh, rabbit carcasses um, and they were pretty decomposed. Do you know if they were jackrabbits or cottontails or were they just too far gone? Yeah, they were pretty decomposed, so it was very hard to tell. Um, the most we could say that it was some type of logomorph. It sounds like there are um, a couple of different species that kind of hang around in that area where the donor lived, um, but we couldn't narrow it down from the samples that we had, unfortunately. Are either of those uh, two general groups of, of rabbits uh, or lagomorphs more likely to be infected with uh, tularemia than the other? Yeah, I think, um, I can't remember the species right now, but um, it, there, it, it did seem likely that one of the species that is in that area um, would be more likely to have been infected than the other species. Um, but again, we couldn't really uh, say for sure. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chris. We have no more questions in queue. Okay, well, that's that's great timing. We're we're at time, so um, let's see. Let's see advance one more. Bear with me. So for free, um, continuing education um, is available for physicians, nurses, health educators, veterinarians, and others. Instructions for receiving free CE are available on our website. The course access code is One Health 2019, and the instructions for receiving um, CE are again on the website. Uh, I want to thank you again for your presentation, for um, all of the presentations from our presenters, and to everyone who called in and asked questions. Thanks for your participation. Please spread the word to your colleagues and. Um, about Zohu Calls free CE opportunities. Our next call will take place on Wednesday, March 6 at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Please send suggestions and questions to Zohu Call at cdc.gov. For more information and to subscribe to our email newsletter, please visit cdc.gov/onehealth/zohu. This ends today's call. Thank you. <laughs>